Creating your own reality. Is it possible for me? I am Jennifer K. Hill, the Consciousness Architect, and I am here to tell you that it's not only possible, it's closer than you might think. Welcome to the show. Hello, friends. I am Jennifer K. Hill, CEO of OptiMatch and host of Regarding Consciousness. And thank you again for joining us for another incredible opportunity to pick the brain of world thought leaders and change makers in the world. Like today, our guest, who is a very special guest, which I know I often say, and I say that for a particular reason. Many of you have heard me share my journey. If this is your first episode, it might be your first time hearing this. But in prior episodes, I've shared how I found out about five or six years ago, I was high functioning on the spectrum and what some people would call neurodiverse. And that really was a cataclysmic moment that shifted my life and how I saw the world. Now, over the last five to six years, I've gotten to meet some really, truly inspiring and incredible people, many of whom we've had on the show. And in particular, Perry Nopert, who is joining us today from the Netherlands, is a unique individual who is helping each one of us to create non-linear conversations that are changing the world through what he created, which is called the Octopus Movement. And so, Perry, it's such a pleasure. I'm so grateful to Michelle and Meredith for recommending you and the Octopus Movement to me, which are taking the world by storm. So perhaps start off by sharing with us a little bit about what the Octopus Movement is and how it was you came to create it. Thank you, Jennifer, for having me here. It's really an honor to be here and so happy to be in contact with you. Indeed, first time we spoke, that was fun, right? It's, <laughs> we understand each other immediately. Like, yeah, I recognize this, I recognize that. It's awesome. So thank you so much for having me here. The Octopus Movement. I want to say so many things that I'm <laughs> that I almost don't know what to say. So what is the Octopus Movement? For me, it's all linked to nonlinear and linear thinking. There is neurodiversity. But what happens if you don't have neurodiversity? What happens if you don't know if you have neurodiversity or not? And I've always been wondering, if we don't fit into the expectations there are around us, what do you do? What do you do when you don't fit in the box? Or when you constantly think, am I doing everything wrong? Why does nobody get me? What's wrong with me? And at one point in my life, I was triggered and I thought, but aren't we missing out on something very important if we look at humans in this linear way that you have to have these, this education or these expectations of this experience or this background or we're missing out on something. And I couldn't pinpoint exactly what was going on. I just had that feeling of, I need to do something. And just prior to that, I did a big reset in my own life. I gave up everything. I gave away everything. I became homeless. And I said, that's it for me. I want to do a hard reset. Something is wrong. And I want to change that in my life. It started with my life. And that's when I discovered, but I have a very nonlinear brain. And I'm living in a linear world. And I've been fighting that battle my entire life. It started when I was a little boy at school with my dyslexia, with ADHD. I didn't fit in. Every time I got the news, it's not good enough. You're making mistakes. The red pencil on my works were always present, always drove me nuts. I had that constant thinking of I'm doing everything wrong. And it took me 45 years to discover I wasn't doing everything wrong. And now I'm thinking, but that's way too late. It's not that the hardship is a bad thing because it also created beautiful things. And it also created the art that I'm in right now. It's based on that hardship. But I do think it's good to have a different view on these elements. And I think if we can balance the linear and nonlinear thinking out a little bit more, in ourselves, then something beautiful might happen. Maybe there is less ego, less discrimination, less misunderstanding, more curiosity. And I think if you balance the linear, nonlinear thinking out, there's more curiosity. And it's linked in many times to neurodiversity 
because so many people that don't feel recognized or have a feeling that they don't fit in and they can't deliver to the expectations around them, many times they're in the whatever space there is of neurodiversity and there is something wrong with them and they need to discover what it is. I find it fascinating. And now we have around 6,000 people like that with us in the octopus movement in 82 countries. And we're trying to do good in the world. We want to solve the unsolvable. And the feeling I had almost three years ago was the right feeling, that feeling of we're missing out on something very spectacular. It's true. These people together in the human mycelium is absolutely amazing. And if you forget about all the unwritten rules, and if you allow people just to be without a mask and be themselves, it's fascinating. That's the tip of the iceberg, <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> That's the octopus movement. It has many tentacles and many different ways yeah. to look at it, which yes. I love. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting that you say that. And coming right before this meeting, it was recommended to me as a business book for fundraising for our company, OptiMatch. And so one of the investors we were talking with recommended Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One. Have you read that book at all? No. But I'm going to re read it now. That's for sure. Yes. <laughs> Zero to one. Yeah. One by Peter Thiel, who is the co-creator of PayPal. And what was interesting about it is he was talking about the exact same thing right an hour ago, right before we hopped on the show. He was saying, listen, in life, we are taught to be linear. It doesn't matter. Like from in order to be successful in business, you have to be non-linear. You have to solve the unsolvable problems, which causes many people to have existential crises of there are no unsolvable problems or the only things left are unsolvable. So what are we going to do? We're just going to give up. And he talks about how in school, it doesn't matter what your gifts are. You're given 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, and you do what you're supposed to do and you get the checkbox. Yet in order to thrive in life, you need to find your secret sauce. You need to find that octopus side of you that is so different and can adjust and be its own animal and its own colors. And yet society were basically put into this factory of human making. And it's causing so much suffering in the world and lack of being known and understood. And that's why I felt so called to want to join the octopus movement and to get to learn more about you and how you came to create it. And Jennifer, why I find this so fascinating. I read a study from some economic research papers that they discovered why people are so linear. So there is this study done by NASA in, in, in 65 or something, and they were looking for the most brilliant, gifted, creative minds because they wanted to go to the moon. And they discovered that 98% of the three to five-year-olds were creatively brilliant. Kids, young kids, right? And then they tested adults with the average age of 31, and only 2% were creatively brilliant. 2%. And they tested 280,000 adults, oh mind you. Yes. So this research paper is looking into, okay, we go to school, and for me, it's all about the balance. It's not about everything should be nonlinear. It's about the awareness that there is nonlinear thinking and linear thinking. Unfortunately, at school, it's all based at linear thinking. You have to be on time. You have to do your homework. You have to do your test. You have to do this period of time. This is how you study. If your way of studying is different, then no. This is how it works, right? If you can't sit still during class, then bad luck for you. You have to sit still, right? So it's very linear. So what is happening is, and, and I find this so fascinating, people with neurodiversity are very good with chaos and nonlinear thinking. Why? It's because people that are very linear are staying very linear because of fear. They are afraid of looking at their own mental state of being. So they want to control everything, bring everything in line so they can predict what will happen in the short and long term in their lives. 
that's a very good system to control the outcome is the linear system. That's why the financial industry is so interesting because that's a very non-linear system. If it would be very linear, then everybody would be very rich on, on the stock exchange, right? The financial world is very non-linear. Nature is very non-linear. But if things become linear, we can predict what will happen. Now, people that like to be in that linear flow have difficulty in looking at their own mental being. They get anxiety when things change, when, in, when innovation comes, when chaos arrives, when things all of a sudden is all different. Find that very different. But then people with neurodiversity, thanks to this linear world, are almost pushed in this corner to look at their own mental state. You're different. You're weird. And you start thinking, but why am I weird? What's wrong with me? So you start looking at your mental being all the time. And that creates the possibility to embrace your own nonlinear thinking and to allow chaos to be there, to allow innovation to be there, to allow things to embrace them, even if they don't make sense to you. It allows you to be very curious. So I find that fascinating. That's an interesting link between neurodiversity and nonlinear thinking is almost based on the linear system forcing us to look at our own mental state because we're so weird, allows us to do more with nonlinear thinking and be more successful in life. Because when you look at the people who made a huge difference, the dude of the iPhone, right? He was very nonlinear. He did everything different. And so many important people who made huge change in the world did that because they're so nonlinear. They were able to be curious. They were able to go into innovation, go into new areas where they had no idea what would happen, but they took a chance and they believed in something. And, and I find that beautiful. And it's, and for me, if we can just talk about it, if we can just create this language to be there, also in education, that we at education can talk about, this is linear, that's fine. We have to get the diploma. And my neurosurgeon, thank you, he has a diploma. <laughs> in it Right? It's it, I love linear thinking as well, but I also love nonlinear thinking, the gut feeling, the chaos, the, the creativity. But we also need the linear systems to make sure my taxes are in order, my whatever. We need both. It's not just being as crazy as possible and forget about all the system and all the rules because that doesn't work. It's about that beautiful balance, I think. I completely agree with you. And I love that you brought up the story about the moon and the studies. Many years ago, I used to host a different podcast when I was running a legal recruiting company called Get Yourself the Job. And one of the gentlemen we had on it was very close. I think it was with Neil Armstrong and quite a few of the astronauts. And he told me the story of how we actually got to the moon. He said, Jennifer, for years, they had the exact same brains, probably somehow linked to the study you're referring to. They had the same type of minds in a room together for years, decades, could never get us to the moon. Then one day, some genius said, why don't we take people with completely different perspectives, completely different motivators, put them in a room, and in less than one month when they did, that's how they came up with a plan to get us to the moon. And that, to your point, is nonlinear thinking. And that's why it's people ask me all the time, how did we come to create OptiMatch? And I literally tell them it was out of survival. I couldn't understand people. People were like, it's you got a book or maybe not you, Perry, but the rest of the world got a book on how to be normal, how to be. Mm -hmm. But when I got my book, it was blank. So I was constantly saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. And I could mimic people really well, but that wasn't me. It was just me mimicking somebody else. And so I think to some extent, all of us, have the capacity for nonlinear thinking, yet we're taught as a society to mask it or mitigate it or minimize it because it's not safe or normal if too many of us are nonlinear thinkers. To your point, if everybody all of a sudden today, all 8 billion people decide to be nonlinear thinkers, we might not have any surgeons left in the world, right? <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> and when you manage your company, 
you need linear structures. I get that. You need people to do their job and to be in a box. Like, okay, you're doing this element and you do that very well and you focus on that. Go for it. We need that. I get it. But in order to create something beautiful or enhance your creations and your results of your companies or you want to explore new areas, you need different thinking. And the different thinking, like what you just said, you're, you're not going to have different thinking by going into a different place with your same team, with a consultant who's a creative consultant and say, okay, on Friday, we're going to a different location, wear something different than normally, and now we're different thinkers. We're not right? It's 90% of our thoughts are the same every day. So if that team is in your company, it's thinking the same thing. And that's what I love, what we've created with the octopus movement. We have a global think tank. And yeah, this is something I'm so proud of. And I'm, I'm smiling because it's so much fun, Jennifer, and I hope to see you there as well soon. We've created a system that within our think tank, we played for a year first with our think tank. I thought, oh, how cool is this? We bring nonlinear thinkers from all over the world together and we create a think tank and we're going to solve the unsolvable. I can tell you the first year it was a complete mess. Everybody loved talking. There was no structure. It was chaos and there were no results. But we're having fun for sure. <laughs> and after a year and I thought, but this is not working. I need to create a system where the system works for nonlinear thinkers. Normally in a, in a company, the structure is like this. 80% is very linear, 20% is nonlinear. If you go to your team, there is always one or two that are a bit different from the rest. They think different things, but the mainstream, the 80% is linear as expected because that's how we hire people as well. We could probably do a whole show about that, Jennifer, and I would love to pick your brain on that how we hire people and how leadership works in the world of linear thinking and nonlinear thinking. Anyway, I've created this think tank and I've created a system that works for nonlinear thinkers. So we have 40 people in one room online, complete chaos. There's music. It's, it freaks out your brain. The people that are first time there are like, this is too much. I can't handle that. I said, trust me, it's going to go well. We do two times one hour. There are lots of questions. There's music. It's chaos. It's organized. And within two hours, we solve things that normally takes weeks. It's because these brains are everywhere on the planet. So it's not a US group or a Europe group or whatever. These are people from all over the world. They're from Bangladesh, New Zealand, Japan, Africa, United States, they're all coming together and we're brainstorming about all kinds of things. The last white paper we wrote was Rethinking Intelligence. And we did a, a think tank about what is intelligence? What does it really mean today? And we think we have to rethink what intelligence is. It took us two hours and then one hour to write the white paper. So it took us three hours to to write a complete white paper. I will share it with you. It works. It works so well. And it's based on, you have to bring people together with different thinking in a system that works for this kind of people. And then we can have very fast results. And that's what we do for our sponsors today. We have created the Brain Force Alliance where the corporate world also enters the octopus movement because the octopus movement is for humans. It's for us, for you and me, people that are listening, but organizations also wanted to be involved. And I thought, but the octopus movement is human. It's not an organization. So that's why we created the Brain Forest Alliance. And organizations are there now as well. They're, they are sponsors of the octopus movement, and we use our think tank to solve the unsolvable for companies or to have different thinking for them to create new products or new ways of managing or leadership or whatever. And it's fast and it's fun and it's different. I can tell you that. 
Yeah, it's. I love that. I, since I was a little girl, I always said if I had it all my way, somebody would just hire me to sit in a room and come up with ideas. Like people laugh at my husband's very neurodiverse as well and very non, even more nonlinear than I am. And we'll just sit there and we'll just make up stories and whole new worlds and ideas. If somebody just followed us around with a pad and paper of just all the stuff that our brains randomly come up with. And that's what's amazing, though, is tapping into that imagination. I remember I had the privilege of hearing Jean Houston speak. Have you heard of Jean Houston? She's a famous author and thought leader at the United States. Yep. Yeah. 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 I've heard of her. Yeah. I didn't know who she was. And she was at a friend of mine's retreat as one of the keynotes. And she shared a story about meeting Einstein. So she was a little girl, maybe five, six years old in New York. And she, Einstein comes to class to a, answer any questions. And everybody's sitting there and saying, oh, it's Einstein. And so like this one kid who's like a bit of a jerk, he's, I have a question for you. He puts up his hand. He's, yes. He's like, how can I be as smart as you? And Einstein gives a little laugh and he says, use your imagination. And then he said, how can I be smarter than you? And Einstein gave another little chuckle and said, use your imagination. And he went on to say, you see, everybody around me, I surround myself with people much smarter than me who handle the math while I envision myself riding around on a beam of light. And I think that really encompasses everything we're talking about. The most brilliant minds of our time, it's not always, yes, you need somebody to be the surgeon or maybe the mathematician, but really it's that being willing to ride around on a beam of light in your imagination that opens up the doors of what could be possible. And and be curious because I noticed that because of that linear thinking, the curiosity is fading away maybe a little bit. These are the expectations. This is how it should be. And I think Einstein must have been curious as hell as well because the curiosity opens every door, I think. And if you your curiosity is in front of you and you're not judging people, what is this guy saying from the Netherlands with his yellow nail polish? I can't take him seriously. This linear thought, fine if you think that. But if you go beyond what you're seeing and what you're hearing and you're just thinking, but what is he exactly saying? What is exactly happening here? Maybe I should ask him some other questions as well. We should be curious because people have so many brilliant ideas. And if we combine that together without the linear structure, oh my God, then beautiful things are about to happen. And that's why I keep saying that we solve the unsolvable because I have a strong feeling that's the way to do it is to work together in this way and, and we can fight climate change. We can do something good for humanity on this world. We can solve huge topics by working together this way. For now, we have done it in a very linear way and we have achieved a lot. Is it perfect? No. Can it be better? Yes. So we need to do something different in order to get there. Otherwise, everything stays the same, right? Too true. And I want to backtrack for a moment. There was something that I like to tap in and imagine that I'm in the minds and the thoughts of our listeners and viewers here. And something that came up, Perry, is people want to know what was it that caused you to choose to be homeless? And what was it that caused you to choose to come back to society? Wearing a mask, trying to fulfill the needs of myself based on others. I had that idea of this is how I should be. And, and I was just trying to overcompensate the fact that I thought I was stupid because of my dyslexia. I couldn't read and write well. I make mistakes. Right? If you have dyslexia and you see a question, then you read it, but maybe you make a mistake in reading it and you give the wrong answer. And then people are laughing at you. Like, how can you give an answer like that? But I thought that word meant something else. So that's the moment in life that I thought, but I'm not living my life. I'm trying to please myself by living someone else's life. I just wanted to be an artist. I, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I, I didn't want to be successful. I don't want to, I just want to be an artist. I just want to make books. 
I just want to make art. I want to create beautiful things. That's the only thing that I want. And my relation, my relationship ended in Brussels where I was living. And I, I had a conflict with the landlord and everything came together. And I thought, this is it then. This is, this is, I need to stop this. I need to reset. And my ex-wife went back to the Netherlands. And of course, I need to be with my kids, but I have three kids. So that was a very difficult period of time. And after seven months, I was able to rent a house, be back with my kids. And I decided, I was thinking, what am I going to do now? I was applying for work all that time, but I didn't fit into the box. Mm -hmm. Me, peri nonlinear, living in a different country, weird background. I lived in China. I did a TV show, a radio show in China. I sold animal nutrition in China. I, I lived in Belgium. My resume, I should send it to you, Jennifer. I think you will start laughing. It's chaos to the max. And I was sending the resume to everyone. Like, I need a job. And I know I'm so good and so passionate about whatever I do. But people couldn't see it because they couldn't place me in a box. And so I didn't get a job, but I had that feeling as well of maybe that consciousness, something else is happening here and I don't know what it is. It's clear, but I can't describe what it is. And then when I was back in the Netherlands, I was sitting in the house, I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do now? Because I was homeless, no income, but it was pure freedom. There are no bills coming in. My phone was paid, still paid by my best friend. I'm driving my mother's car. I'm completely free. And what do you do when you're in complete freedom? Then you start thinking and having a conversation with yourself saying, okay, this is freedom. Now, what am I going to do? Because in that freedom space, it feels like you can do anything you want. So although there was nothing, it felt like there was everything. And then I said to myself, okay, everything is possible. So now what am I going to do? And then I thought, if everything is possible, I'm going to set up a nonprofit and create awareness of these amazing people that don't fit in the box where I think we're missing out on something important. And I had no clue what I was doing, Jennifer. People were saying in the beginning, so, Perry, what is your business plan? A business plan? I don't have a business. I don't need a business plan. I'm an artist. I don't do business plans. What is your blueprint? Blueprint? This is a nonlinear artist. I don't do blueprints. I want organic change. Say that again, Perry. I think we lost you for I'm a Curious what will happen if I just very organic without any plans, just do it, bring people together. I, I just want to be sure everybody got what you just said because there, there was just a blip in the internet there for a moment. So you said you just were like, okay, screw it. I'm just going to go out there, no blueprint, no business plan, and make it happen, basically. Make it happen. Just go with the flow, serve the wave. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm bringing amazing people together. I went to the Philips organization in the Netherlands and I asked for an MRI machine. This was hilarious. I went to them and said, can I have an MRI machine? And I was still homeless when I asked that. And, I, and they said, why do you, you ever, who are you? What kind of question is this? Why do you want, why do you want to have an MRI machine? So I explained to them that I wanted to do research in what it means to be wired differently. People Constantly talk about that. Oh, your brain is wired differently. How? What does it mean? Is that possible that my brain is wired differently? I don't get it. I want to understand. They didn't give me an MRI machine, but they put me in contact with the director of design of Philips, and she allowed me access to her research team of 32 researchers. It said, here you go. Let's talk about this. And we checked all kinds of research documents, papers to discover what is that, what's happening in the brain. And she also asked me, what's your blueprint? I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I just want to know. I'm just curious. And that's how it all started. Yeah, I totally understand that. I was sharing with Dr. Dave Rabin, who is a neuroscientist on the show a few episodes back. 
And I told her when I was probably 10 years ago or so, I had my brain scanned long before I knew I was neurodiverse or any way to explain that. And I did find out that I had two alpha waves where the average person has one. So like you, I'd be so curious to know, what did you find out from it? Were there any data points that surprised you as what you thought it was? Indeed, the internet connection is so-so. I apologize for that. Can you rephrase your last question, Jennifer? Yeah, so I would love to know, Perry, as what was it? What did you discover out of your research with Phillips? That there is much more research needed, that there is not a lot of research available how the brain is wired differently and what it ex exactly means. And it, it motivated me a lot without having a blueprint, but in my head, how I see the future of the octopus movement, I would love to set up a research center of the octopus movement eventually and dive into this research and really discover what is nonlinear thinking. You know who we should partner with on this, Perry, is do you know Dr. Almond of the Almond Clinic in the United States? I've heard about that. Yes. Remind me, don't let me forget, a dear friend of mine, KJ, she once sent me a video and it's about the seven types of ADHD and how it shows up in the brain and what it means for the people. You would love this video. It's amazing. But he, I think, is the person who has studied the most brains on the planet. He's done something like almost 90,000 brain scans. And I could just see there being a really interesting collaboration we could do with him. Wow. I would love that. I would love that. And I recently spoke with a neuroscientist in Moscow and I spoke with her. She is specialized in elderly people. And we were talking about, I know some older nonlinear thinkers and they're fascinating. They live a total different life. They're still, I know, a very good friend of mine, she's 83. Yoka, you will meet her, Jennifer. And she has two bags. That's all she has. Half of the year she lives in California. Other half of the year she lives in the Netherlands. She's Dutch, but she was in the United States a lot. She is phenomenal. She is very nonlinear. She's very curious. She is a book at the human library. She's very active at the octopus movement. She's 83. She celebrated New Year's Eve with us in my house. She just went to Greece. She's traveling. She's going everywhere. What is it that nonlinear brain sometimes with people creates a whole different life than other brains that was maybe a bit more linear in a way? I would love to do so much research. I'm so curious. How does that work? What does it do to our health to be very nonlinear? How does it work with your anxiety? If you force yourself into these expectations of linearity and what does it do to your stress level, your anxiety, what does it do to your health? What does it do to your health to be more nonlinear and just serve the wave and see all the connections that are possible? What does it do to your health? What is linked to that? Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, we want to know so many have things. Many people will we'll definitely pick this up offline because I have lots of ideas bouncing around in my head. Perry, I would love to have you share where can people join if they want to join the Octopus Movement? Where can they find out more about it? Where should they go? They can go to www.theoctopusmovement.org. You can become a member for free. There are no rules. I'm so proud of this, Jennifer. There are no rules. This is diversity. We don't even talk about diversity. Everything is possible. So you don't have to be a nonlinear thinker. I think every human being is a nonlinear thinker. Done. End of story. We're all humans. There is no system. There are no rules. Sign up. You can decide if you want to be active in the think tank, if you want to be a founding member. We have an inner group of founding members that are very special to the Octopus Movement. We have ambassadors. We have teachers that teach at schools about nonlinear thinking. There is a documentary coming up, then people can see more about my life and how I see nonlinear thinking and what it all means. Just go to the website, sign up there. You get the links automatically to join all kinds of other groups and be a part of everything and solve the unsolvable with us and be in your tribe where you don't have to mask, where you can be yourself, where all kinds of intelligent, amazing people are there who are also having the same desires as you have in doing something 
spectacular in this world and connecting with each other. And recently I saw someone in the octopus movement being interviewed and she said to the interviewer, it's so weird not to be the weird one in the room anymore. <laughs> Normally I have always been a bit particular, right? And that's not the case anymore at the octopus movement because everybody is themselves well, and, and colorful. And it doesn't mean that when you take a screenshot of a Zoom meeting in the octopus movement that everybody has nail, nail polish or weird things or weird glasses. Not at all. We're very normal. But without a mask, we can be ourselves. We're very human. I think that's it. Yeah, I love this so much, Perry. That's, again, why I felt so deeply drawn as soon as we got connected to it, because having lived most of my adult life up until the age of about 38 or so, and facade was my favorite word growing up, because that's all I knew is how to mask or how to put on a facade. And then it's you take off the mask, and for the first time in maybe four decades, you can breathe. You can be yourself without fear of judgment. Now, I will say there is some PTSD from, you know, I don't know if it happens to you or I'm sure it might happen to others of us in the octopus movement where sometimes we do have, uh, I sometimes still worry, oh God, did I say the wrong thing or offend that person? Because there's that old scar tissue, if you will, of like the getting ostracized or perhaps bullied for not fitting into a paradigm. Though the great part is that now it lasts moments instead of days, weeks, months, years, or being incapacitating. Now it gives you the freedom to go, oh, that's right. That's that old paradigm I get to live in. I can observe it from a place of compassion, and then I can shift my paradigm and move into a new place where I give myself permission to be myself again. I lost most of my friends just because of that facade and mask. They don't understand me. They didn't understand me. And when the, when someone doesn't understand you, then sometimes the only way out is judgment. And of course, I wasn't completely myself. I was also trying to do my best to please everyone. So that wasn't all, also the best version of myself. I made many mistakes in my life. But I there is some tissue there, definitely. And I think about that many times. Oh, dear. But I noticed in the movement itself, I can be totally relaxed. I don't have to worry about that. If I go out there and I meet people in different circumstances, then sometimes I can detect it very easily that, oh, this would have gone, gone wrong in the old days. Mm -hmm. Now I have language that I can use to express myself, to explain myself, and it doesn't go wrong anymore. It's very strange how I'm not in a struggle anymore with the linear world. I, I used to fight it constantly, and now I embrace it, and it works very well. So I totally hear what you're saying, and sometimes I have these difficulties of taking a deep breath and thinking, oh dear, I hope this is going well. And I remember one time talking to my psychiatrist in Brussels and I said to him, I said, I don't understand. I strongly believe that I'm a good person and I have lots of love in my system and well for everyone. Why do people get into fights with me? It, I don't get it. I'm not looking for fights. Why is there difficulty? And I think I'm generally a very good person. And we had some very interesting conversations about that, also linked to neurodiversity, also linked to being fearless, where there is a lot of fear in the world. And when the connection isn't aligned, then the response can be very upsetting. And that struggled me my entire life because I was thinking, why is this person mad at me? I, I didn't do anything wrong. Why don't you get me? Why don't you understand what I'm thinking? Now I do understand why they don't get it. But back then, I had no idea. So, yes. That, yeah. is, that is our dream. When people ask me, what is your purpose? What is your mission? I always tell them, Perry, it is to reverse the accidental adversarial relationship between human beings. And if I yeah. can do that for one or more people in my lifetime, then I've served my purpose. So that is exactly what you're doing with the octopus movement, giving us a place 
to be seen, be heard, be known, and to be accepted maybe for the first time in our lives. So for on behalf of everyone at the Octopus Movement and all of the future members will join, thank you, Perry, for the gift you've given us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And it's such a pleasure. It's so much joy. I'm enjoying this so much. It's so much fun. And it's it's everything and it's nothing at the same time. And that's why I think it's beautiful. It's not a system. It's not rules. It's not, we're nothing. And that's why it works so well, I think. Thank you, Perry. Thank you to each of you out there. Maybe we've sparked that little bit of uniqueness in you, that little bit of creativity that might have been suppressed. And it's this little glimmer and you can blow on it as you would an ember of a fire and allow it to turn into a raging fire that allows you to step into your passion, step into your wholeness, and to become who you are always meant to be. I am Jennifer K. Hill. You've been here with me today with Perry Nopert from the Octopus Movement, and we are so grateful for your time and your listening. Thank you. Thank you so much.